Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. Really excited for a look at the preseason AP Top 25 for college basketball. Now listen, this year we're gonna cover college basketball a ton, usually in mock drafts, player breakdowns for the NBA draft, but I also just do really care about college basketball. I love watching college basketball. There's a lot of great hoops. Now, listen, I do prefer the NBA over college basketball. Let me know down in the comment section which one you prefer between the NBA and the NCAA. But I think there's just a lot of fun watching good basketball at all times. So let's jump into this video here. Leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and let's jump into it. And I want to start in the others receiving votes with specifically one team I was pretty surprised about. Indiana, only three total votes into the top 25. So of course they do not make it. They're on the others receiving votes category. And I was pretty shocked by this. Um, yes, I know Indiana did lose Trace Jackson Davis. They also lost Jalen Hood Shafino, but they did pick up Khalil Ware in the transfer portal. Uh, I think Malik Renew is gonna have a better season this year. So I was kind of shocked to see Indiana on the outside looking in for this preseason poll. Now listen, so much will change from now and even say the second or third AP poll of the year. So the numbers at the end of the day don't matter too much right now. It's just kind of a preface to some of these teams and what we're expecting to see. So Illinois at 25, listen, Coleman Hawkins is still there. Uh, of course, you think about some of the great players to have come out of Illinois in the last couple of years, Kofi Coburn. Uh, you also have, I would assume, new. Uh, but Illinois has just been kind of a breeding ground for good talent, not just NBA talent, but really great college basketball. I think the uh, Fighting Illini are going to be firmly in the race this year in the top 25. Alabama, the Crimson Tide, of course, last year had Brandon Miller. He goes to the NBA draft, gets drafted second overall by the Charlotte Hornets. And, you know, Alabama, this is going to be an important year because they also lost Noah Clowney. So, and Charles Bediaco, there's a lot of pieces moving around here. We'll see what uh, Nate Oates is able to do. But Typically does a great job, runs very modern style of offense, and I think because of that, Alabama typically finds success offensively, uh, specifically with their uh, pacing and spacing. They are they do a very good job getting three-point shots up uh, and just a very efficient mathematical approach to the game, uh, so it's no surprise that their head coach is a former math teacher. St. Mary's, uh, headlined by Adrian Mahaney. Uh, he's got a real shot to be an actual legit draft prospect this year. St. Mary's uh, typically don't see a lot of kids coming out of uh, St. Mary's for the draft, but in the West Coast Conference, uh, I think that we've seen a lot of really talented players. Uh, Mahaney specifically was the West uh, Coast Conference Player of the Year for the preseason, uh, preseason player of the year. So St. Mary's has a lot going for it. Villanova, 22, right in the center of where you'd expect them to be. Villanova, just such a great basketball school, always has been, almost seemingly always will be. Uh, I believe even the very first AP Top 25 poll, Villanova was in the top 15, I believe. So it, it just feels like Villanova, the Wildcats are just going to be in this conversation. They always are. Uh, I think they're coached relatively well. Now I know the last couple of years have been a little bit of a transition period for them, but I think going forward, we're gonna still see Villanova around this top 25 quite a bit. USC at 21 was quite shocking for me for a couple of reasons. Now I do really like uh, the players that they have brought in. Now Bronny James, it's a big question if he's actually going to be like really a full participant this year or not, of course. Had uh, the incident a little bit earlier on the last couple of months. Uh, spent some time in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so let's get some prayers up for Bronny James. Let's keep him in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, you never want to see uh, anyone have any type of situation like that, especially not a really talented young basketball player like him. But they have Isaiah Collier as well. Uh, USC the last couple of years, they've been breeding good NBA players. Uh, you think back to a guy like Evan Mobley. I, I, USC, they've been a pretty nice college basketball destination. Of course, when you're playing down in Southern California, it's a pretty good spot to be. So uh, you're gonna attract some players. Of course, USC, the Trojans this year have a pretty strong freshman class. Now, freshman classes don't necessarily guarantee you a lot of wins. We've seen that in years past where top end recruiting collections don't go on to win the whole thing or maybe even win at all. Sometimes teams just struggle out of the gate. So the USC, it's just because they have a lot of talent doesn't mean it's going to all mesh together. They do have a lot of really good guard play. We'll see how that all meshes together. I do believe in the Trojans, but I have to kind of see it a little bit first before I say, hey, this should be a top 15, top 10 team in the nation because college basketball is often predicated on big man play. And I think USC is going to have some challenges, but I think they've got the talent to overcome some of those challenges as well if things click correctly. Baylor, this is a perfect example of a team that when their front court play is great, they're great. Uh, Scott Drew is a very good coach. 
the Baylor Bears are typically really, really great. You think back to the Torian Prince clip uh, asking about how Baylor got out-rebounded in the tournament. Sometimes that's just what happens, and it seemingly happened to Baylor more last year, not just specifically rebounding, but their front court play was just a little inconsistent. And I think uh, with some of the injuries that they had, uh, guys coming in and out, they had a lot of backcourt talent. Uh, when you look at guys like Keontae George, Adam Flagler, LJ Cryer, I mean, that's a very talented collection of players. Uh, they just weren't able to win as much as they would like to, uh, and I think it really was predicated on the front court play. So hopefully this is going to be a stabilizing year for Baylor. Of course, no Keontae George now, but uh, they're going to have to overcome some of those losses, and they're going to also have to make up for some of the deficiencies they had last year. I think 20 is a fair spot for them. You see they do drop quite a bit, but if there's a team in here that I think, hey, this team can overcome some of those adversities, Baylor would be my pick. North Carolina, they lose Caleb Love. Uh, they're at an interesting spot in their uh, in their program. Of course, do have Puff Johnson still. I, UNC, I think, is very, very good. Armando Baycott came back for another season, which was huge for that program. And people are going to say, oh, look, losing Caleb Love really sucks. And hey, Caleb Love's had a, a pretty good preseason start for Arizona as well. But ultimately, when it comes down to UNC, the strength of their team is interior play. And this is what I'm talking about with kind of the big men ruling NCAA basketball. North Carolina is a really good inside team when they play through Armando Baycott. And over the last couple of years, uh, you know, with guys like Leaky Black, Caleb Love, uh, they would just struggle sometimes playing to their real identity. And I think that kind of a little bit of addition by subtraction losing Caleb Love, it hurts to lose a talent like that. But I think their team is going to be a little bit more in tune with itself in terms of what their shot profile should look like, what their shot diet is. Uh, and really how many times a game Armando Baycott is touching the ball in the low post. And I think it's going to be good for them. Last year I was really, really low on UNC. If you go back to my preseason AP Top 25 poll last year, when they were ranked number one, I said this team is going to be a disaster. The comments told me I was an idiot. And well, guess what? The team was a disaster. This year, I don't think they're going to be a full-on disaster. I think they're going to actually be relatively solid. I think they're going to hover in and out of the top 25 a bit, especially early on as they kind of adjust without Caleb Love. But ultimately, this team is good, and I think there's going to be some real successes this year. Texas and San Diego State at 18 and 17. Texas has been a really stable program. Dylan Mitchell did return to the program. He, of course, was testing the waters last year with the NBA draft. Did not go out. I think Dylan Mitchell is going to have a night, another good season. I think he's going to take some steps forward from last year. Um, and ultimately, Texas just a, a pretty talented team. They always do a good job getting uh, high-profile names in the building. You think back to a few years ago when they got Marcus Carter transfer in. They just always do a nice job, it seems like, of filling out their roster with notable names. So Texas, for me, the Longhorns, uh, with the stability that they have, even with you know coaching changes, everything going on around that program uh, within the last 12 months or so, I think that the Longhorns are going to have a good year this year. I think 18th is about fair. Um, we'll talk about some of the other teams above, though. The Aztecs, uh, just a, a good college basketball program. Think back to some of the most recent years, uh, specifically a few years ago when they were undefeated going into the tournament, it felt like. Uh, San Diego State, just they just know how to hang around as a college basketball program. Uh, and I think in the Mountain West, they're going to have a real shot this year at uh, winning the conference and, and being a, a real threat in the NCAA tournament this upcoming season. 16 is really the one I'm most excited to talk about in this entire video. Kentucky at 16, I was very shocked when I saw this is where Kentucky landed. I think the Wildcats are really, really, really good. They've got a ton of talent up and down the board. Justin Edwards, uh, you obviously can point to him. You, just looking at the entire collection uh, of pieces that they have, uh, Rob Dillingham, who was playing for the Cold Hearts in the OTE last year, uh, overtime elite for those of you who are not really in tune with the NBA draft process, uh, he was really great for them. And then now in uh, his opportunities in Kentucky with some team scrimmages, he's been showing out as well. So I think the Wildcats uh, are a real sleeper. Now, like I said earlier, uh, when I was talking about USC, just having talented freshmen doesn't guarantee wins. We've seen that in the past for Calipari uh, and kind of how the couple of seasons for Kentucky have gone within the last half decade or so. But I think Kentucky's going to be really dangerous this year. I like their talent a lot. And I think they're going to be really potent. I, I expect them to be a top 10 team in the nation sooner than later. Texas A&M, nice to see them on here for the Southeast Conference. We have another uh, SEC team here in Arkansas. Um, Arkansas last year really loved what they had. Nick Smith Jr., 
uh, Anthony Black. Uh, I think really the big question for them is what does uh, Trayvon Brazil come back and look like? Uh, and what kind of numbers does he put up this year? Because last year they kind of had a loaded roster. A lot of their guys either graduated or went to the NBA draft prematurely. And because of that, they're going to have a little bit of a transitional period. I think 14 is a little high for them. Uh, now we'll see what they do. They've got a really good head coach. They win a lot of games historically in the last four or five years or so. So I think Arkansas is going to be very, very dangerous still. Um, although with kind of the changing of the guard in terms of the roster, I am a little concerned. Texas A&M at 15, though, like I said, I think this is about right where I would expect them to be. U of M, uh, uh, University of Miami, the U, I, you know, I think that they're really interesting. Last couple of years, they've been producing players um, in a way that we haven't necessarily seen as much. I think they are a team to watch for this year in the ACC. Um, you know, we'll see some more ACC teams later on, but UNC at 19, Miami at 13. I think they're in a pretty good spot. Arizona highlighted them earlier. Caleb Love showing out in the preseason a bit. Um, think back to a couple years ago when they had Benedict Matherin, Christian Coloco, of course. Now it's kind of a different team completely. And that's one of the beautiful things about college basketball is the turnover sometimes is so immense, so quick, uh, that really the best coaches stand out by adjusting to their roster. You can't run the same type of offense with Christian Coloco and Benedict Matherin as you can with Caleb Love. That's just kind of the reality. I, I expect Arizona to kind of go through some of those lulls this year of adjusting to that. But at the same time, they have the talent uh, there to, I think, be a top 15 team. Um, and hopefully there's not that kind of internal struggle, internal dilemma that we saw with UNC last season. Gonzaga at 11. That's pretty shocking to see them this low. Of course, no Drew Timmy. That's the massive change in the program uh, but Gonzaga just typically does a good job finding a new guy to replace that type of role listen they also now no longer have uh, Julian Strother who's been playing great for the Denver Nuggets in the NBA preseason I think Gonzaga is going to be an interesting team this year uh, because not only do, do they have to figure out their new starting big man to replace Drew Timmy they have to figure out the wing position to replace Julian Strother the WCC West Coast Conference is very 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 talented. It's really a conference that has grown a lot within the last three or four years. You think about, you know, Brandon Pajemski last year getting drafted in the first round out of Santa Clara. Uh, you think about uh, just a, a bunch of guys, Maxwell Lewis out of Pepperdine. Uh, there's been a lot of waves, <laughs> of course, pun intended there with Pepperdine uh, coming out of the WCC lately. So uh, Gonzaga, it's going to be a tough season. It doesn't, they don't just get to walk into 25, 30 wins like people expect. It's Pretty hard earned right now in the WCC, and we'll see how that goes for them. Florida Atlantic, the real feel-good story last year from the March Madness uh, bracket tournament. FAU went way longer than uh, I think anyone really truly expected them to do. Adrian Wojnarowski was ahead of everyone saying FAU could have a, a real shot this year, uh, talking about last year. Uh, making a run in the NCAA tournament. They had a great run, and I think they're poised to come back and, and compete again. Look at them up 15 spots here um, in the preseason AP Top 25 poll. I think that is well-deserved. They got so many more votes than Gonzaga, um, and honestly, I think this is really well-warranted. Tennessee, just kind of a breeding grounds for tough, physical, good basketball. It just seems like every year they're producing a guy who, a little bit of a tweener, but he just plays, competes, works really hard. Um, I think that the talent on the roster is fairly complete. I, I do think they are a top 10 team. I think this is a warranted ranking coming into the season. Um, you know, they got they got guys there that I think can play um, real high-end minutes in the deep end of the college basketball playoffs. And that's when, when you have that, when you feel like you have those players on roster coming into the season, that's when you have a real legitimate shot at making some serious noise in NCAA basketball, and I think that's what the, the uh, volunteers are going to look to do this year. Creighton at eight, a really, really important offseason for them, uh, where they got Ryan Kalkbrenner to stay, they got Arthur Kaluma back, they got Baylor Shireman back, and because of that, the roster is really loaded. Um, I, I think eight is maybe even a little too low. I probably would have had them a little bit higher myself if this was my own individual rankings because it's kind of the perfect storm here where all of your players are kind of entering the real prime of their college careers at the same time. Uh, I think Baylor Shireman, a really good ball handler, really good decision maker for them. I think he's going to be vital for them this year. Uh, Kaluma staying was a pretty big surprise to me. I thought he would have been a draft pick had he come out probably in the second round, but Decides to play another year for the Blue Jays. I like that. They also have Trey Alexander, who's a, a really nice piece. 
uh, Creighton's a Creighton's a dangerous team this year, and I think they're going to make some real noise in college basketball. Houston uh, at seven. This is a big transformational year for them as well, uh, which is always the fun part of time about these teams in the preseason is we haven't really seen them play a whole lot, and who's going to step up? Who's going to make some of those big shots. Last year and last couple of years, it was Marcus Sasser for Houston, who was, yes, a really good individual defender, really good team defender, but also just a big shot maker. And then they also lose Jairus Walker in the top 10 in the NBA draft. They had two first round picks out of the University of Houston. Now the Cougars are looking to replace those guys. That's going to be a challenge especially when it comes to their shot profile and who's scoring the basketball. I trust the coaching there. I think that they're going to do a great job still building a good competitive team defense, but there's going to be some challenges along the way. UConn at six almost feels low to me. The defending national champs uh, were fantastic. Now, listen, they did lose some key players, Andre Jackson Jr. being one of them, Jordan Hawkins, of course, the other. That kid was on a burner last March, just pretty much hitting everything he shot, it felt like, during the tournament. But... They're still really loaded. Donovan Klingon, uh, a really good prospect for the NBA draft. Real chance he goes in the top 15 picks. Uh, last year only played 13 minutes, but he averaged over six points in those 13 minutes, averaged over six rebounds, averaged nearly two blocks. Uh, he's going to step into, I think, a significantly bigger role. Now, one really important thing to watch for here, um, last year when you had a guy like Adama Sanogo ahead of him, you could afford him fouling. Now, this year... Uh, that's going to be a concern. He averaged two fouls per game in 13 minutes last year. So if you're looking for him to play 30 plus minutes, he's going to foul out a decent amount, especially at the rate he was fouling last year. Part of that comes with the territory of being a shot blocker, rim protector. That's okay. But I think UConn's going to have to figure out the, the center depth a little bit and, and see what they have behind Klingon. Early on, and then Stefan Castle, uh, a top 10 recruit this year. I think he's going to have a nice season for UConn. Uh, and I think they're going to use a lot of ball screen this year. Uh, last year was a lot of off ball screen action for Hawkins. I think the offense is going to have to adjust a little bit this year to maximize Stefan Castle and Donovan Klingon together. I think the two of them could be a really good pairing. Uh, it just kind of comes down to how uh, Coach Hurley puts the two together and, and figures things out on the fly. And I think he's going to do a, a very good job of that. Marquette at five, good to see a Big East team in here um, in the top five. And then we have Michigan State at four. Now, listen, we're kind of getting into some of those Midwest Midwest teams here. Marquette in Wisconsin, Michigan State here, uh, of course, in Michigan. And Michigan State's got some real players, A.J. Hoggard, Jay Nakins. Those are two guys that are going to be legitimate draft prospects this year. Uh, probably, I think right now, trending towards second round selections if the draft were to be today. Of course, it isn't though. So there's this whole season for them to make up ground, maybe catapult themselves into the first round but I think one important thing about Michigan State typically their players don't play for draft positioning uh, usually they do a very good job internally getting players to play the right way getting players to play within their scheme within their system to promote winning and sometimes that doesn't help their draft stock but it helps them win basketball games. That's what Michigan State's all about. That's all they've been about uh, basically during my lifetime. Michigan State is on always, 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 always winning basketball games. They do a great job there at the program. Um, Coach Izzo is just fantastic. And I think Michigan State's going to be a real threat. Purdue at three, two words, Zach Eady. Getting him back was massive just like how massive he is Purdue is going to be very reliant on him this year you could argue he's the best player in college basketball right now um, I don't think that's crazy to say because he's such a dominant low post threat now I, I know Purdue absolute collapse last season just did not play good basketball for 40 minutes last year in the tournament but I think coming into this year they're going to be hungry I think they're going to be looking to kind of right the wrongs and because of that, I see the Boilermakers making a, a real run here, not only at the Big Ten, which I would say they're favorites right now to win. Michigan State's a, a close second, but I think right now Purdue is the favorite if I had to vote. Um, and then secondly, off of that, they're a real threat um, in the NCAA tournament, uh, especially if they make some adjustments to last year and, and uh, you know, if Zach Eady takes a step forward as a passer. Number two, we've got Duke here, the Blue Devils. Uh, listen, again, we've talked about how important it is getting some guys to stay for Purdue, especially Zach Eady. Duke's the exact example of that as well. Kyle Filipowski stays. He was a real hub of their offense last year, did a lot of ball handling, creation. Uh, think about some of the lobs he threw to Derek Lively, his operation out of the middle of the floor, uh, especially in five out sets. I think Duke ran through him a lot, and I think him coming into his sophomore season 
probably still a first round draft prospect if you had to guess right now, but I think he's most specifically going to be a very, very good college basketball player. And I think that's going to help Duke a lot. Tyrese Proctor, I think probably one of the big breakout players to watch for this year. Uh, he's really, really, really good. Uh, I think that his kind of analytics, you look at all the stuff that he does, um, on the basketball floor, I, I think his decision making is really good. His downhill capabilities, and I think going into year two, you know, last year toward the end of the season, the, you could tell the game was starting to slow down for him a little bit. His processing speed was picking up. Uh, he was diagnosing things quicker as a ball handler, decision maker. Um, because of that, I think Duke coming into this year, very talented team. John Shire just got a big extension. Congratulations to him. I think the Blue Devils are destined uh, for a really great season this year, which I'm happy to see. And then number one, uh, I think this is super well warranted uh, for Kansas. They've got really great guard play. Uh, of course, they get the big transfer, probably the best transfer in all of college basketball in Hunter Dickinson. They land him and it just separates them. Bill Self always does such a great job coaching up these young kids to playing great team basketball. Now you give him one of the most l um, dominant low post options in the game right now in, at the college level. In Hunter Dickinson, I think Kansas is going to be a real problem. The Jayhawks have a really talented roster, uh, just top to bottom. They have a lot of talent pretty much everywhere. You think about a guy like Kevin McCullough as well. Uh, it just seems like they're going to make plays. Uh, they've got the wings to you know, be feisty, competitive defensively. They've got the low post option. They've got the pick and roll play with their point guard situation. Uh, probably one of the best point guards in all of college basketball. I think Kansas is just going to be set up. Uh, for another really great season, nothing new. Bill Self is all about winning. It's all he's done since he's taken over that program, and I expect that to continue this year. For the most part, I feel like the AP Top 25 got it right. There's a couple things I would have changed. UConn a little bit higher, maybe Creighton a little bit higher, probably would have had Kentucky a little bit higher, but for the most part, um, I do like everything that I've seen here in the AP Top 25. Of course, this was released October 16th. Hopefully you guys did enjoy. We'll be tracking the college basketball AP Top 25 all year long. So if you did enjoy, leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more, and we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.